Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. Hope everybody is doing good. Look, I'm going to be real brief with this. First and foremost, I need to uh, remind everybody that we are still in the middle of a fundraiser for the work we do in the black community, especially with Black Men Lead, uh, Rite of Passage Initiative, and the wraparound services for mental health, skill development, job acquisition, and so forth. Uh, we definitely need your support, uh, as well as uh, the work we do with young women uh, through my wife's Marion's program, uh, Restoring Ghettos, Forgotten Daughters. Look, uh, the link is in the description box. I don't want to really get into a long, drawn-out uh, uh, monologue about why it's so important. If you followed me uh, for any stretch of time, uh, I've been talking about the importance of socialize, racially socializing young black boys uh, for more than 10 years. Uh, let's, let's really get behind these programs. We need them. <coughs> Excuse me. What I want to talk about here is something that, again, is dear to me, and it, and, and it proves that the struggle of the black man and the black male and blacks in general is not... Uh, exclusive to foundational blacks or, or descendants of slaves in America. Uh, uh, about a year ago, I told you about a story of a little uh, kid in the UK called Dijon uh, Reed, a 14-year-old kid who was chased down by a white mob led by a then 14-year-old teenager who ultimately caught him, beat him, and stabbed him to death. Uh, those trials took place recently. All were acquitted of the charge of murder. They were found guilty of the charge of manslaughter. Uh, the person who actually dealt the fatal blow and led uh, the white mob uh, was a 14, then 14 year old, now 15 year old, uh, who's unnamed because of his age, was found not guilty of murder, found guilty of manslaughter, despite the fact that his uh, plea of self-defense was rejected by the jury. Uh, the judge himself said that if he would have been an adult, more than likely he would have been found guilty of murder. Um, but all involved, and the crazy thing is, while the leader of the mob was a 14-year-old, there was a 39-year-old and another 34 or 35-year-old who took part in it. Um, this kid didn't have a chance. He wasn't armed. It was a disagreement, and obviously it was racially motivated. Uh, and, it mar and it mirrors so many stories that we hear about here in the U.S. and while we have our own unique issues here that we obviously have to deal with and confront, I think that it's important that we remain aware of what our brothers in the diaspora, uh, brothers and sisters in the diaspora are facing. And we need to also be uh, active in developing uh, connectivity, um, and developing strategies and agenda. One of the things that I've talked about for a long time is the lack of a, an agenda that we operate in and the lack of protocols. Uh, when I study the groups that are in power, when I study the groups that are consistently as a race are collective, successful, and moving and powerful they operate from an agenda they operate from protocols and i'm not just talking in race i'm talking race i'm talking religious groups i'm talking the lgbtq community i'm talking those who literally are getting political traction social traction economic traction where we tend to be stuck in the same place we don't move through a, a, an agenda that that needs to be a measured specific idea of where we're going uh, what we are going to do to get there what we're going to do when we get there how we're going to operate and move as a collective and that doesn't happen um, I did create the blueprint for black empowerment man again over 10 years ago it's it's still on the site I did uh, 
come up with the Black Code of Conduct, which I've asked other people to contribute to and help with. Uh, this isn't about me. It's about me taking what I know and saying that I'm going to give everything I've got and then I want to connect with other people who want to do the same. And so I've always asked people to contribute, to be a part of it, uh, to help, to join in. And I'm willing to join anything that you have going on uh, that is positive and helping to build a community. Uh, again, this is about the work that I leave behind. Uh, that really and truly speaks to the empowerment of my people and the generations to follow because I'm leaving a world to my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren and their children. And I want to leave them something that gives them a better chance than was handed down to me so that they can take that baton and go further. But we're going to have to be willing to put in some work. We need an agenda. Another thing that we need that other groups have is protocols. Protocols are things that you have set in place that when something happens, this is what you do. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to scurry around. You don't have to go wander. You don't have to misact, misrepresent, mismove. You simply know when this happens, you do this. When, when we are in need of this, we do this. When someone does this, when someone comes into our community and kills uh, 10, of, 10 of our uh, people in our community, including the elderly, this is what you do. When someone kills a minor in our community, regardless of whether it's someone in our community or someone outside of our community, this is what you do. When we need to develop and build programs, this is how we fund it. These are protocols. These are the ways you move. You don't have to ask, you know, everybody knows what's expected of them. Expected of them, everybody does it. When you study these other groups, you find very powerfully imprinted protocols there's a set of man there is uh it's almost like a script when something goes down watch what white supremacy does they're operating from protocols when this happens this is how we're going to spin it they already know how they're going to spin it they don't have to go think and run through they already know how they're going to spin it and the thing is they've invested over 1300 uh invested in over 1300 different think tanks that deal with everything from economics to education uh to mass incarceration to gentrification and everything else they know how to keep the system moving we have maybe one or two think tanks that's a problem we have way too many issues not to have great minds coming together to think about the best way to move it we need to be developing these things we have programs in place that simply need to be supported we need to have a way of significantly and consistently funding programs. We need to also have an understanding of where we want to be three years from now, where we want to be five years from now, where we want to be 10 years from now. We can't sit up and everything be a, re a reaction to the latest uh, hor horrific story in our community. That's not how we're going to get ahead. We can't react our way to power. We have to direct and, and work our way to power using specific strategic means and mechanisms that we create, that we fund, that we operate in. I think about that little boy and I think about all the little boys that we see that have died at the hands of hate. And then all the uh, young black boys and girls we see that are dying at the hands of hate from their own that we don't like to talk about, that we don't give the same vigorous uh, uh, push to demand justice from. And, 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 and the thing is, that internal disruption into the natural progression of who we are as a people is a big problem. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. We don't want to talk about incest. We don't want to talk about domestic abuse. We don't want to talk about intimate partner violence. We don't want to talk about the lack of business ownership. We don't want to talk about the lack of holistic education. We don't want to talk about serial force displacement by way of uh, uh, subjugation and acquiescence to and compliance to a system that does not support us. We don't want to talk about that because then that demands accountability. That demands that we take some responsibility in doing what is necessary to strengthen our community. We want to keep demanding that someone else does something. We want to keep demanding that someone else fixes our problems and we ha as if we haven't learned already. You are never going to get the people who created the problem to fix it because they created the problem because it benefits them. And they're never going to fix it because they're never going to um, 
voluntarily surrender their power. This is a power struggle and we're losing because we don't want to come together as a unit. We don't want to come together as a people. We don't want to sit down and literally develop agendas and strategic uh, uh, protocols that will govern our behavior and, and serve as the standard of how we move and operate. We don't want to do that. We just want to sit around and complain. We want to complain about how horrible the kids are. We want to complain about how terrible they are. We want to complain about how our girls are carrying themselves on social media. We want to complain about how violent the boys are when the when the pro, when the proper uh, mechanisms to help them be better are there. But we won't get behind it. We won't support it. We won't move. We won't get together. We won't develop in, in, any strategies. We don't want to stand together. We just want to complain, and we wonder why we are where we are. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, you know, when that story hit about Dijon, you know, it immediately arose up because even though he's across uh, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, he and his family were across the Atlantic Ocean, the story was just too familiar. And I wondered, when I, when I got that story last year, I wondered, you know, how many other people are living those realities around the world and there is no active collective movement to do anything about it. I look at my young boys here and they have so much promise and they get so excited when you're working with them. And I look at the, 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 the many that have struggles with mental health and how they are being handled, the many who have struggles with uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences that nobody wants to acknowledge and nobody wants to confront. That is going to have lifelong imp implications. When I look at young black girls who are struggling with their identity, young black girls who are struggling with a sense of worth and value and uh, a sense of a, a problem with uh, abandonment and so many other things and we're sitting around and we are not actively engaging that struggle and we're expecting these young babies to grow up and be productive viable contributors to our society and to our culture and then we get upset when they venture off into the, these destructive behaviors as if we couldn't see it coming I'm telling you it's coming if we don't do what we're supposed to if we don't properly socialize young black boys like with programs uh, rite of passage programs like Black Man Lead, they're going to have an increased uh, risk of being violent, an increased risk of dropping out of school, an increased risk of incarceration, an increased risk of recidivation, recidivism, an increased risk of domestic violence, an intimate partner homicide. That 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 that's what's looking at them, and it's a setup. It's a setup, starting with uh, engineered poverty in the community. It's a setup. We have to attack poverty. We have to determine how to best deal with poverty. And the only way you deal with poverty is you help these individuals increase their earning potential, teach them how to use their money, teach them how to pool their resources, teach them how to invest and hold assets instead of accumulating liabilities. All of these are things that they should be taught that aren't being taught in the community. And we're wondering why there's a problem. Criminology 101 tells me that where there is poverty, there will be violence, there will be crime. Why? Because people are not going to sit by and voluntarily starve to death. People are going to fight for something. They're going to go after it. It doesn't matter whether it's illegal. They're going to eat. And then the problem is once they start eating and they find out that actually they can live pretty good doing this type of crime, they literally trade in a life of freedom and potential empowerment for a life of being in and out of a system because when I get out, I'm going to live and I'm going to do me. And when they catch me, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do this time until I get out again. And they don't understand the damage and the devastation that that brings to the community because they have not been properly socialized. We have not given them a place. We have not given them a role. We have not given them a responsibility. We are leaving them to come together on their own and figure this thing out, and they aren't doing a very good job of it. It's time for us to stand up. It's time for us to put in work. It's time for us to stop sitting around going, oh my God, shaking my head, and all this other stuff that we do every time we see something that's absolutely devastating. There's an African proverb that says that when the, the, the child cannot feel the embrace of the village, he will burn it down to feel its warmth. We are witnessing that in a massive way. It's time to stand up. It's time for us to literally get our head in the game. Look, I'm challenging every last one of you. 
become a part of the solution. Do something positive. If you if you, if, if if your strength isn't getting in and be boots on the ground, get behind programs that are doing it and fund them. Funding is a major issue in this situation. Funding is a major issue. What I can tell you, it's not the large organizations that do the work, but the large organizations get most of the funding. It's the people who are going down, putting their hands on it. It's the people who uh, are getting the phone calls. Like you know, I get phone calls all the time of uh, you know trying to help people, trying to. Uh, help them figure out I mean everything from finding a place to stay uh, to dealing with mental health issues to proper socialization to issues within the school district and edu public education and I even have clients that I'm helping them with the issues they're facing in in, in, in higher learning uh, I have several that are in college and facing some major challenges because that's just the things that happen and no one has an advocacy program for them that functions to really actually represent their interests. Everything is a setup and if they don't know any better they fall into that loop and then everybody says well, we gave them a chance and they weren't able to handle it. No, you set them up and I'm not going to let you set them up so here I come and I am uh, developing more and more presence on that level and I'm coming and I'm speaking for them and I'm using my knowledge of empirical data that supports why I'm standing for them and supports what they're complaining about and, and, and supports the fact that it's unfair and we have to do this but we have work to do you know I know it starts out about this little kid but that kid that for whatever reason you know you get them ones like Little Malaya Davis, that little baby just never leaves my mind. It's been a few years now, and it never leaves my mind. Uh, the little girl that was beaten to death by her mother in Brooklyn, uh, that comes from issues that we haven't dealt with in the community. We don't want to talk about it. We're going to say she's evil, and we're going to leave it at that. The act was evil, but where, where did it come from? She wasn't born to be that way. What happened? Who failed her? And why is it important now? Does it excuse what she did that she was failed? No, but it could have stopped it if we would have helped deal with it. If nothing else, if we could have identified that she's not a good parent and we had our own system of sitting up and, and, and getting these kids and bringing them into positive environments and protecting them, because what I can tell you from personal experience, the foster care system isn't protecting them. That's one of the most dangerous places for them. And yet, so we, we have work to do. Babies are dying. They're ki Some are killing themselves. Matter of fact, uh, five, ages 5 to 11 and ages 10 to 13 are uh, led, blacks now lead those uh, two age groups and predominantly girls. Young black males, 15 to 24, 49% uh, spike over the last six years. We got to wake up. We can't say we're pro-black. We can't say we're for black and we're sitting around watching this and we're inactive. Stop selling that. It's time to put in the work. It's time to be invested in the future of our people. I say, I'm going to say this and I'm done. Uh, somebody asked me about 10 years ago, what is it going to take to achieve true black empowerment? And I said it's going to take men who are willing to plant seeds into the future of our, our people, which are our children, seeds that they may not live long enough to see come to fruition. And, and people ask, what does that mean? That means that we've got to stop the Band-Aid approach. Everybody wants a pat on the back, so everybody's looking for quick fixes. There is no quick fix. We need to raise up a generation that's untouched, untouched by the Eurocentric idea of what's beautiful, untouched by the Eurocentric idea of what's classy, the untouched by the Eurocentric idea of what's professional, untouched by the Eurocentric idea of what's powerful, and then we must guard them and, and instill the values, interests, and principles that, that will make us strong as a future. We need to put that into a generation that's untouched, that doesn't see white as being better, that does not think the white man's eyes is colder, and that they see the beauty in themselves, and they see the power in themselves, and they love themselves, and they see a future for themselves, and they're ready to step out and walk into their true meaning and their true identity, their true nature. We have to do that. We have to plant seeds and see if I'm 
I'm planting these seeds. I understand that it may not come in my lifetime. I have to be okay with that because see, I'm leaving my progeny, my progeny behind. I'm leaving the seeds that I've planted from my loins behind. And it's important that they have a world to live in that's better than the world I lived in. And if I don't get to see that, okay, but I've got to know I put the work in to make it happen. I've got to see the seeds starting to sprout up. I've got to see that. So I've got to plant. We need people who are ready to plant. Look on that note, I'm about to get out of here. I wish you the best. Take care. Support the work we're doing. It's imperative that we get that support. The link is in the description box. Also, you can give through the organization's cash, cash app handle, which is also in the description box. Show some love. I appreciate you in advance. On that note, I'm out of here.